right now on KCCI State House Debate. From voter ID, minimum wage, and stand your ground, Iowa lawmakers are working late hours on a lot of different legislation. This morning, we talk with representatives of both parties in the Iowa Senate. KCCI 8 News Close Up starts right now. This is Iowa's news leader. This is KCCI 8 News Close Up. Good morning. Thank you for joining us for KCCI 8 News Close Up. There is a lot happening at the State House this session. We begin with the Stand Your Ground legislation that recently passed in the House. KCCI's Laura Terrell has more on the debate happening at the Capitol. I've been to almost every homicide scene in this county for 26 years. Polk County Attorney and, John Sarcone uh, says he's seen enough yeah. violence and he doesn't want to see any more, but he worries a new Stand Your Ground law will escalate it. It's a recipe for increasing violence and actually in states where this law has passed, the violence has increased. Right now, the law allows Iowans to use deadly force to protect themselves in their home, car, or business. But this new legislation expands that to public places. It's a solution that's looking for a problem. And there isn't a problem. We have a very good self-defense law that's well-balanced. Right now, 35 states have stand your ground laws and advocates say it's about time Iowa does too. Now, what stand your ground really does is it makes it so you no longer have the duty re to retreat anywhere that you are lawfully able to be. The Iowa Firearms Coalition says this stand your ground law will only keep Iowans safer. When people say to me that it's going to legalize murder, murder is always going to be illegal. The standards for justifiable use of force remain the same. And joining me to talk about Stand Your Ground and a lot more is Republican Senate Majority Leader Bill Dix and Democratic Senator Nate Bolton. Thank you both for being with us this morning. Yeah, thank you. So, Senator Dix, let's start with you. What kind of support does this legislation have in the Senate? You know, the proposal that's been passed in the House is something that uh, we haven't seen a lot of the details with yet, but, uh, you know, it's something that we definitely plan to take a look at. Uh, and there's a lot of support for uh, continuing to move policies forward that uh, are, are, are a great interest to law-abiding gun owners in our state. Is this something that would have the uh, support to get through the Senate ju uh, Judiciary Committee and to the full full Senate? I expect that we're going to have a debate uh, on this bill and it uh, doesn't mean that there won't be a few changes made but uh, you know, like I said, we'll take a look at what the, the House has sent us and, and definitely plan on uh, taking time for debate. Okay, Senator Bolton, what are you hearing from your fellow Democrats about this bill? Well, more importantly, what I'm hearing from Republicans in the communities that I represent. Uh, I had a press conference uh, recently with Sarah Karovsky, the mayor of Pleasant Hill, uh, who's a Republican and she is a, um, a concealed carry permit holder. And her concern was, when we move standards like this, uh, does it really make the community safer? Uh, I was joined at that press conference by the chief of police for, for Pleasant Hill as well as the chief of police for Des Moines, Dana Wingert. Uh, and their concern is simple. If we don't do enough to protect people on the streets and we move that standard to potentially allow the aggressor in a gun violence situation to have the upper hand in legal proceedings afterwards, we have to pause and make sure we're, we're addressing those concerns. Well, Senator Dix, Iowa ACLU officials say that since states like Florida have adopted stand your ground uh, laws, justifiable homicide rates have tripled. Uh, do people have a right to be concerned about the increased use of deadly force? Are we looking at heading down back to the wild, wild west here? Oh, certainly not the wild, wild okay. west. And, and you know what? the focus of the legislation is and what we're going to definitely consider as we move forward with this is in a lot of states where this has been adopted uh, the fears that people have been uh, talking about simply don't happen and I think it's important that everybody remember that it's law-abiding citizens who are put in a position perhaps in some environments from time to time where the stand to your ground legislation re would really come to, to bear an interest where there might not be someone uh, in that environment to defend and protect the law-abiding interests of everybody else to be there. But don't we currently have Iowans on the books right now have the right to protect themselves anyway? Why do we need this particular piece of legislation? I think it just clarifies and, and goes a step further in making sure that uh, law-abiding citizens here in our state have that right and uh, responsibility. Well, Senator Bolton, don't uh, law-abiding citizens have the right to protect themselves in this way? 
They sure do. Under the current law, they have plenty of protections. And that's the thing that I think most people really misunderstand about what this legislation means. I believe that most people think that they should have the right to defend themselves in their home. They should have the right to defend themselves in their workplace with no duty of retreat. Well, well they have that now. And in public places, there's no duty, duty to retreat when it would compromise your safety. So right now what we would be doing is sliding that scale and again my concern is we're actually giving uh, the advantage to the aggressor, the perpetrator in these situations where the law abiding concealed carry permit holder uh, could, could be taken advantage of. And opponents of the legislation have said this will just result in more guns in public places in Iowa. Do you think that will happen if this passes the Senate? I don't believe that. And with what, again, what's most important is that in a public setting where there might not be uh, anyone in the uh, in in the arena or in the, the the environment there to defend and protect against a bad person who shows up with bad intent, now under this law, potentially somebody would be in a position to protect the life and and liberty of others in the room. And I know you said you haven't had a chance to really look over the particulars of the House version, uh, but what we do know is that the bill allows those under the age of 21 to use a handgun while under direct supervision of a parent or a guardian. Current law prevents those under the age of 14 from using handguns. Is this opening the door for more accidental shootings, gun-related injuries, things like that? Yeah, I, the important thing there is that uh, everybody learns the respect that needs to be for a firearm and uh, how to appropriately use it and, and trained and understanding uh, what, they're, what they're working with and what, uh, what they need to be to make sure that they know how to properly use it and, and not use it in a reckless manner. Is there an age that's too young to use a handgun? Well, you know, I think it all comes down to respect for the firearm and proper training, and, and we have to look and, and do some searching on what actually we have in statistical reports from other states and actually do this based on information, not theory and myth, and, and actually base it on fact. So I hope that's what the process will be in the Senate as it goes through the Judiciary Committee, which I'm on, and then onto the floor. All right, we're going to take a break. Up next, the voter ID law that recently passed in the House. We'll talk about that coming up. And welcome back to KCCI 8 News Close Up. On Thursday, Republicans in the House approved a voter ID bill after nearly 12 hours of debate. And that vote was along party lines. The bill would require state identification at the polls. That's Senator Dix, let's start with you. Will a voter ID pass in the Senate? When do you expect to debate this? Uh, you know, we probably will under, uh, under the joint rules. Uh, take a look at this sometime here in the next couple of weeks. Um, again, we need to look at the details of the bill, but one thing that's clear to me and uh, a message that we heard loud and clear in the last ele uh, election, Iowans have been asking for this. Uh, they want to bring additional integrity, uh, security into our voting system and making sure that the people who are voting are, are voting legally. And that's what the goal of the, leg of the legislation is. 
All right, Senator Bolton, the, the days we show ID for just about everything we do, what's wrong with showing it at the polls? Well, I'd say the first thing is it's a solution to a problem that's really not existent. There are not a lot of people showing up at the polling place saying, oh, wait, somebody's already voted for me. Uh, that's, that's something that we're not seeing. When we see uh, incidents of, of misconduct at the polls, uh, frankly, it was a, a situation here in, in Des Moines where we had uh, someone try to vote intentionally twice. Um, those are felonies. I mean, th we have severe penalties for people that try to get around our voter uh, laws. The thing about showing your ID for common occasions, well, that's great when you want to check out a book, but we're talking about a very fundamental right here. And if somebody loses their ID temporarily, are they going to be denied the right to vote in an election? Uh, and then we look at the populations that don't have as regular access to IDs, uh, the elderly and disabled populations. Uh, we need to find ways to make them more able to participate, not put a roadblock in front of them. Any idea how many Iowans over the age of 18 don't have an ID? You know, I'm not sure on an exact number, but it would be disproportionately affecting those populations. Yeah. I think the answer to your question there, as far as how many people are actually don't have that ID, the estimates I've heard are around 5 to 7 percent of the voting population. Okay. And the legislation also takes into account those situations and allows for a numerous other forms of identification in the event that uh, they don't have that uh, typical ID. Well, you had you had mentioned that there uh, we want to Iowans want to make sure that there is better security with uh, the voting uh, responsibility here in the state. There are people who say the voter fraud really isn't a problem. I think you kind of just touched on that, Senator Bolton, and this is a solution in search of a problem. Um, what is your response there? We the the number of voting um, irregularities in the last election was very very small. I find it though very, very curious. Why would you resist something like this? You need, you need to produce an ID to get on an airplane, to buy adult beverages, to check out a book at a library, all of these things. It's not an inconvenient thing and it does provide Iowans and voters with that uh, security uh, that it, it, people are going to be here who are going to be voting or going to be doing so in a legal manner. And, and that's the number one thing. We need to do everything possible to ensure that our voters' uh, confidence is there, that we have that kind of integrity in our voting system. With Senator uh, Bolton, Senator Dix says this isn't going to prevent anybody from voting. Uh, Secretary Pate says this law is not intended, nor will it prevent anybody from voting. What's your response to that? Well, we just heard from Senator Dix, five to seven percent of the population wouldn't have an ID. It's a lot bigger number than the number of individual incidents of any kind of electoral misconduct that we've seen in our state. So we're going to penalize five to seven percent of our population, make it harder for them to participate in hopes that we're going to solve a problem that really is non-existent on, on exercising a fundamental right. I just I think that's disproportionate. Is this a photo ID? The current legislation that came over from the House does not have a photo ID in it. Uh, you know, that's one of the things that we'll take a look at as well and evaluate uh, what we want to do. But, uh, you know, the most important thing, again, is making sure that everyone that has the right and opportunity to vote is going to be there. But the, the opportunity for fraud, if it's not a, a photo ID of the person who's voting, is, would still be as great as if you were not requiring a, uh, an ID at all. Isn't that correct? I, I'm somebody that's always been a believer. I've uh, signed uh, requests in the past when the Democrats were in control of the Iowa Senate to uh, support a photo ID. I believe that that's common sense. Um, but you know, there's also new technology that's being developed that is being incorporated into this bill that Secretary uh, of the State, Paul Pate, has been working on as well. So you know, I think we just need to evaluate uh, all of the latest uh, opportunities that we have to provide uh, Iowa voters that kind of integrity. And several county auditors have expressed uh, concern that the measure is underfunded uh, and will burden local governments. How do how do we pay for this voter ID, this state issued ID? Yeah. Well, and and to the point about uh, suppressing voters and you know IDs for voters that don't have that ID, that's where the expense primarily comes. And uh, I think Iowans should be well assured that whatever expenses are incurred by this new proposal, uh, we will be funding it.
this at the state level? It, it, it'll be Iowa taxpayer money that because uh, it's not my money, it's not your money, and uh, that's something that I've been a strong believer in as time goes along too. And we're going to treat it as such. But you know, you know, providing uh, solid integrity to our voting system, I don't know what is more important. And uh, if, if it takes a small investment of Iowa taxpayer money, then we're going to do that. And my guess is, uh, Senator Bolton, you'd say there's a better use for that money. There's a better use for that money. And the implication here is that somehow our elections don't have an integrity process right now. We do have integrity in our elections in Iowa. We don't have a high rate of voter fraud. We have very few incidents of electoral misconduct. And there are criminal penalties when that happens. So. Again, I think it's putting obstacles in the way of, of participation in the process that aren't needed. We need to increase access to the polls. Okay, we're going to take another break. Coming up next, minimum wage. Our conversation continues on KCCI 8 News Close Up. Hundreds of people showed up for public hearings at the State House on the controversial minimum wage bill last week. Many Iowans said they just can't afford to feed their family on $7.25 an hour. But business owners in favor of the bill said they need a universal wage to be able to grow their operation. And Thursday, the Iowa House approved a bill that would ban local governments from raising the minimum hourly wage. Senator Dix, what are the prospects for this legislation in the Senate? I think the prospects are good. Uh, we need to take a look at the, the language and uh, make our own evaluations of it here with, with all of the state senators. But, uh, you know, one thing that is really clear and what we want to accomplish this year is focus on policies that really make it easier to do business in our state uh, to create new career opportunities here, attract new investment to our state that allows for increased population and increasing our tax base. All of those things benefit Iowans. And making sure that we have a uniform policy uh, dealing with uh, those wage arrangements makes a lot more sense than just having a patchwork of, you know, literally hundreds uh, of, of those different kinds of laws around the state. And Senator Bolton, there are business owners who say it'd be far easier to do business with a uniform wage. What's your response to that? Well, I agree, and I think these counties would agree, too. We'd like to see the minimum wage increase to address the problems that you were mentioning earlier. 
uh, $725 is not enough to get by and make a meaningful income for your family. We've got people who are willing to work 40 hours plus a week that can't make ends meet. So these counties have stepped up and said, we need to do something about that problem because the state has not. Uh, I'd prefer to see a statewide increase in the minimum wage to deal with that on a more uniform level. But until we do, I think it's right for these counties to do what it, they need to do to protect their citizens. Well, Senator Dix, Governor Branstad did say just last month that he would support a, a, what he called a modest increase in the uh, hourly minimum wage. Mm -hmm. He didn't give a number. Mm -hmm. What's your thought on that? Is there room for a modest increase in the minimum wage? You know, what I'd like to spend most of our time on, because if you, when you talk about the minimum wage, uh, that's really not a new idea. It's been around for a long, long time. And it hasn't shown, when you really look at the data, that it actually raises the standard of living for our low wage earners. What we need to focus on is a, an environment here in Iowa where we have higher paying jobs uh, that are available to our state. Rather than focus all of our time and attention on those low paying jobs, how can we better train our, our, our uh, workforce and, and keep those kind of opportunities in place? And then really making sure that you know, our job creators here in this state are able to compete and grow and offer new opportunities to, to the men and women who are, are in those communities to work and also to attract new business to, to our state. That's how we really grow uh, wealth in our state. It's how we grow the standard of living with the people. And, and that's what Iowans expect us to do. They want us to really change the way we do business in Iowa. And that's what I'm taking very seriously as we go forward. So is that, is that a no then to increasing the minimum wage in the state? I believe that by doing that we will increase the minimum wage. You know, increasing that competition, uh, creating those new kind of career opportunities raises wages for everyone. And, and that's how, because you know, you have people who are on fixed incomes. Mm -hmm. If you artificially raise wages, the costs of the things that they have to have go up. And, and how, are, how are they supposed to maintain their standard of living? County officials in Polk County and Johnson County, uh, before voting to raise their minimum wages locally, did a lot of homework on that. Uh, Polk County Supervisor Tom Hawkinsmith told lawmakers that uh, the minimum wage task force studied the issue for months. Um, is that work then for nothing? You know, I, I think that this can really be decided. The marketplace does very well at that. Today, uh, people are earning well above the minimum wage in most cases. So again, I think what, where the focus needs to be is how do we grow our state's economy and create those new higher paying career opportunities for Iowa. Well, Senator Bolton, is that where the focus should be on um, bringing in better paying, higher paying jobs and training skilled workers for those jobs? Absolutely, but I don't think it's exclusive of, of treating the minimum wage as a real issue. Uh, there are real people counting on the minimum wage to get by, and they're not getting by. So when we, when we say we want to grow the economy and have better than minimum wage jobs, that's great. But there are actual people that count on the minimum wage to make ends meet. But there's also the argument that most families don't solely rely on a minimum wage paying job. Uh, Senator Dix said it here. Uh, we've heard it in other places. So what's your response to that? They're not fictional people. These are people that are actually counting on a minimum wage job to help them get by. Just because most families aren't making a minimum wage, some are, and we have to worry about those people. Second with that, we, we hear all the time about the need for local control. Well, these are local governments that have stepped up for their citizens. And right now what we're doing something is taking away power of the local government, not letting them do what they need to do for their citizens. And the, the last thing I'll say is, you know, Senator Dix mentioned wanting to, to do things that actually increase the quality of life of Iowans. And I think that's great. And I think we need to start doing that in the Iowa Senate. We haven't seen any bills that have done that. We've seen a lot of bills that have taken away rights in the workplace. We have a bill coming up on workers' compensation benefits that will strip away protections for injured workers, people who are working and putting their lives on the line, their bodies on the line for our economy. Let's start taking care of those workers. And Senator Dix, you were nodding your head with some of what uh, Senator Bolton was saying, your reaction? Well, what, what I think of the, some of these local decisions that have been made by cities and counties to raise the minimum wage has not been very considerate of what it does to the ability of our job creators in our state to compete. You know, I've, I've been contacted by a number of uh, employers, one, a cupcake uh, retailer in, in Cedar Falls, Scratch Cupcakes. You know, she has four or five different locations in different cities and is, it makes it difficult for her to compete because she has to do all the different paperwork and all the different uh, 
jurisdictions where they, they, they're there. And it really begs the question whether or not she can continue to do business. So we need to make sure that Iowa is a pleasant, uh, attractive place that rewards people for taking risks and, 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 and offering new career opportunities. Okay, we've got to take a break. We'll be right back. And we are wrapping up our conversation with Iowa State Senators Bill Dix and Nate Bolton. Let's talk about bipartisanship. Republicans have the majority in the House, the Senate, the governor's office. You're smiling very broadly, <laughs> Senator Dix. Uh, where's the room for bipartisanship here? There's always room for bipartisanship in the process, the way it's set up. Uh, we go through committees uh, and then uh, bring b debate to the floor. And there's not always necessarily agreement. Uh, but certainly uh, we're all listening and uh, reaching out and trying to find as, as, as much harmony as we possibly can 